Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Nathan McGregor, and I'm a third year uh, PhD student in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department here at UC Santa Cruz. I'm the Graduate Student Assembly Representative for the Committee on Teaching. We welcome you to the celebration of the Distinguished Teaching Award. This is the closing event for the second annual Teaching Week, which is a collaboration be between the Teaching and Learning Center and the Academic Senate. It has been a fantastic week, beginning with a symposium on pedagogy with over 100 people attending, and yesterday's afternoon, yesterday afternoon's intriguing conversation about AI with, again, over 100 people joining. What this week has shown us is that our campus not only has innovative and committed instructors, but that there is a real desire to think and gather around new ways of teaching and being in the classroom and at the university. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Cameron, and I'm a professor in the history of art and visual culture, or HAVOC, as we like to call ourselves. And I'm the chair of the Senate Committee on Teaching. This is, um, before we hand it over to campus provost and executive vice chancellor, Lori Kletzer, to introduce our event today, we would like to share some brief acknowledgments. As you know, no event like this happens without the work of a lot of people. The committee is grateful to Chancellor Cindy Larif support of the Senate's varied efforts to recognize and promote outstanding teaching at UCSC, including the Distinguished Teaching Award. Thank you, Cindy. We would first like to thank Robin Duncan, the faculty director of the TLC, and her fabulous staff, particularly Hillary uh, Shellett Bennett, for their hard work in the planning and successful execution of events throughout the week, which Nate has told you about. Specifically for this event, we would like to acknowledge our co-sponsors, the Hispanic Serving Institute Initiative. We would like to thank Diana Hogue and her team at University Advancement, UCSC Catering for helping to organize this event, and ITS especially for their support in making it possible for us to run it both in person and remotely. Finally, I would like also to thank my, to express my personal gratitude to the fabulous Rebecca Hurtis and Michelle Chamberlain, part of our extraordinary Senate staff who have gone above and beyond to make this event happen. Thank you. Okay. The final acknowledgement is given in the spirit of thinking about the larger world in which UCSC as an institution exists, and as we as students and teachers move. We would like to offer the land acknowledgement before we proceed. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking UP tribe, the Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of an indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. We are truly delighted to be able to gather in person on this land and remotely to celebrate the extraordinary teaching that happens every day at UC Santa Cruz. I know it's been said before, but members of COT really do have the best job on campus because every year we get to read the moving and often inspirational nominations, putting our colleagues forward for Senate Teaching Awards. We currently are being inspired by the nominations for the 24-25 Distinguished in Teaching Award and look forward to announcing the recipient at the end of the quarter. But this afternoon we are here to honor and learn with teaching professor Allegra Eroy Revelis, recipient of the 2023-24 Distinguished in Teaching Award. Thank you all for being here, and I'd now like to welcome Campus Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Lori Kletzer to the stage. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon to honor one of UC Santa Cruz's outstanding faculty members. The Committee on Teaching may have the best job on campus. I don't know. I actually think I have the best job on campus. But I will say that this afternoon is for many, many, many of us the best afternoon on campus. 
Established by the Academic Senate's Committee on Teaching in 2019, the Distinguished Teaching Award was created as a counterpart to the Excellence in Teaching Award, an award that students initiate by nomination. The Distinguished Teaching Award gives faculty an opportunity to nominate their colleagues and to recognize pedagogical contributions that often go beyond any single course. This award particularly seeks to recognize instructors who've made significant contributions to educational equity within and beyond UC Santa Cruz. Creative, innovative, and socially engaged teaching practices are centered in many of our conversations and approaches here. And through the Distinguished Teaching Award, the campus and the awardees and all of us carry the values and the commitment and the legacy of that work forward. This award celebrates our deep commitment to teaching and learning as we journey together to become a student-centered research university and continue to pursue excellence and equity for all our students. And today, we are here to celebrate Allegra Eroy Reveles, Associate Teaching Professor of Chemistry, who has been awarded the 22-23 Distinguished Teaching Award. Professor Eroy Reveles is a Santa Cruz County native growing up in Watsonville. She is a banana slug, earning her PhD in bioinorganic chemistry here at UC Santa Cruz. After a postdoctoral fellowship at UC San Francisco, she was an assistant professor of chemistry at San Francisco State. In 2018, she joined us here on our faculty. Becoming an academic was not her plan, as I understand, when she headed off to Amherst College. As an undergraduate chemistry and Spanish double major, she planned to become a pediatrician and serve her hometown. However, after attending her first SACNIS, that's the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans conference, she knew that scientific research was her true calling. But consistent with the Allegra who we all love and know, she was compelled to change the focus of that. She transitioned from synthetic inorganic chemistry and chemical biology, her doctoral and postdoctoral work respectively, to research in chemical education in order to expand the number and diversity of students pursuing careers in science. Her focus is on developing engaging and supporting learning environments in large enrollment general chemistry courses and in interventions that increase the performance and retention of historically underrepresented students in STEM courses and STEM majors. Additionally, she has developed novel active learning techniques, reevaluated curriculum, and led efforts within chemistry and biochemistry to create new approaches. Her work to developmentally ramp up the needed mathematical components resulted in a full redesign of the general chemistry curriculum, thank you, which has been a model in other disciplines in the physical sciences. She is currently working with colleagues at other UC campuses, <clears throat> excuse me, as a co-principal investigator on a project funded by the National Science Foundation with the goal of increasing the number of Latinx teaching-focused faculty in STEM. In the past, the recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award has presented a lecture at this afternoon gathering. Instead, true to form, Professor Eroy Reveles has invited her friends and colleagues Dr. Mika Estrada and Juliana Ortega to join her in a roundtable conversation exploring the many paradoxes of joining soul and role in teaching and mentoring while also balancing life as Latina mothers. Juliana Ortega is the Director of STEM Diversity Programs at UC Santa Cruz. She is also a UCSC alum receiving a bachelor's degree in biology and Latin American and Latino studies, and is currently enrolled in a doctoral program in educational leadership at UC Davis. Juliana received the 2020 UCSC Outstanding Staff Award for her very important roles as leader and mentor to students and beyond in the larger rural world. Mika Estrada is the Associate Dean of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity at the School of Nursing and a Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences at UC San Francisco. She earned a PhD in social psychology from Harvard. Known for her expertise in undergraduate STEM retention, Professor Estrada is the principal investigator on several National Institutes of Health grants and sits on numerous National Academies committees. Yvonne Rodriguez will be facilitating today's conversation. She is the director of National Program Impact and Talents for the Surge Institute. She also has her own business 
as a STEM equity coach and consultant. Dr. Rodriguez transferred to UC Santa Cruz from Chabot College and was a student parent. She received a PhD and a BS from here in physics. She also has an MBA from Bentley University. It is now my pleasure to hand things over to Dr. Rodriguez to begin the roundtable discussion entitled, The Paradox of Authenticity in Teaching and Mentoring. Enjoy. Thank you, Executive Vice Chancellor. Come on up, panelists. First thing I want to say is I have my notes here. I'm not ordering DoorDash, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great to be here. Um, great to be back on campus. I have so many memories here. My three children practically grew up here. So um, it's just, and, and I grew up here with, with, with Allegra. So I, um, I'm just curious, how many students are in the audience? All right, all right. Thank you for being here. First off, I want to just honor my good friend, my sister Allegra. I'm so proud of you. I know how hard you worked. I know the obstacles you overcame. We did a lot of celebrating together. Um, but you move forward with so much strength and so much power and so much genius, not just for yourself, but for the community for our people. That was always at the core. And so I honor you for that. And I'm so grateful for you. I want you now to come up and tell us about the paradox <laughs> of authenticity in teaching and mentoring, but also just like how you're experiencing this award. So before we start um, the conversation, uh, today I want to dedicate this award to my grandmother, to my nana, Aura Iroy. And she's present here in these flowers on this chair. Um, as a teenager in high school, I got to live with her and learn more about being an educator than any book or class could teach. Even though she formerly was a community liaison for Pajaro Valley Uni Unified School District, the family she worked with called her Maestra Aura. And this person who escaped poverty, the poverty of Puerto Rico, by marrying a Filipino man at the age of 14, later got her GED when her youngest, her sixth child, was in high school. She taught me education is a political act. Education is empowerment. Education is most transformative in community. Many people in her job would work one-on-one -on -one with families, helping them get resources to support their family, but she knew she wasn't going to be a gatekeeper. She started a parent empowerment group called Grupo Renacer, where parents would teach each other how to read, how to drive, how to advocate for each other in the face of incredible bureaucracy. This woman who only had a GED organized trips to Sacramento to meet representatives, got people to run for school board, sat on the board of Salud para la Gente to be a voice for the voiceless. I strive to make the impact that she made, but also know that if she were here today, she would tell me to take care of my kids, <laughs> be home by four, <laughs> put limits on my job, it ends, and then I, need have, and then I do my other job. So I tell you, that 10 years from now, once my youngest is a teenager, watch out. <laughs> um, so just like my grandma, I won't, be, I won't be a gatekeeper. My classes won't be gatekeepers either. My classes will be designed to be gateways, and I will be a wayfinder. And that's what this is about, the reason why I brought this all-star team <laughs> here, is that when we come into the classroom, we don't come as one person. We come with everything who we are. We come with our community. We come with the people that have shaped us. And these people have shaped me in so many ways. They are the people that I go to when I have challenges, the people that we became mothers together, 
We were graduate students together, collaborators, publishing together, and making ourselves who we are today. And so they have incredibly unique stories to um, what our dominant culture is in science. And so I'm just really excited for you to hear how we all got to be here and how our experiences have shaped our philosophies on teaching and mentoring. Thank you, Allegra. I just want to give a, a, a few minutes for the panelists to introduce themselves um, a little bit more. We, we've heard your bio, but what else do you want to share about who you are? Um, I think the thing I'll share with you is, I think we all have kind of non-traditional pathways. So a lot of times when you're a student, they kind of say, this is how you get through to become an academic if you want to become an academic. Um, and when I was, so I did, my, I did my undergraduate at UC Berkeley, and I went to Harvard for my graduate studies. And while I was there, I got married, and I had a baby in the middle of my PhD. <laughs> and when I went to graduate, I, had, I was pregnant with a second child. And I dropped out of academia and stayed home with kids for 10 years before I, and I thought at that point that I was never be in academia again. That's what I was told and that's what I expected and that's what I had seen. Um, and so I think that might be one of the, the unique aspects of, of my career is that I had no intentions of ever being in academia after I graduated with my doctorate and somehow found my way back to it by accident for sure, by accident. And uh, so that's, that's a little bit of who I am. I have three kids now, by the way. <laughs> they're, all, they're all, my youngest is gonna graduate from Penn State in May, so they're all grown up now. So for me, um, I'm gonna start by saying that I'm where I need to be, and I just didn't know at the time. And um, after uh, finishing uh, UCSC, I actually ex I experienced a lot of failure as a first-generation student in being in STEM classes. And so my story and the story that my students get to hear is one that involves uh, navigating a lot of you know family poverty issues, uh, under resources, and multiple areas. But also a story of a lot of failure. I failed physics, and I failed molecular cellular developmental biology but I still found the way and I'm still here. And so this was before all the data that is now available for HSI. When I look at those charts and those numbers, I'm like, oops, I was not supposed to make it. <laughs> and, um, but that data was not available and um, there was resources in place that helped me be successful, like the ACE program. And I also was a student in the IMSC a program that I now run. And these were the places where I found community. These were the places where um, helped me get through. And so as a first generation student navigating all these issues, being the first in my family to go to college, um, finding those resources and learning how to navigate these systems was really essential. And so when I, when I reached the point of graduation, um, I was on the path first to be a doctor. That was what I wanted to do because your parents want you to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> and then, you know, it sort of happened that I had my first undergraduate research experience and that wasn't here, it was at Iowa State. And it was back in the days where there was a flyer and you tore out the little thing and then you <laughs> typed in the website and you printed out the application and you mailed it and then you didn't hear. But I got accepted and one of the things my mother said, how do you know that this is safe? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, but it's an institution. I know it is somewhere. And, and, and by then they had learned to trust me because I had made the decision to seek higher education. So they gave me that sort of freedom to say, okay, if you think this is it, then go for it. And so after that, um, my father, returning back to campus and finding research and really kind of saying, okay, this is another possibility. I did our undergraduate research in Phil Cruz lab and I was like, I'm gonna be a researcher. And then I was gonna graduate, but then my father lost his job as a farm worker. And I said, oops, priorities, I'm the oldest, I need to help. I need to 
find a job. And that's how I landed being in student programming. And then I, I really realized that there was a whole other world of, of being involved, of making an impact, of, of sharing my lived experience and, and fostering that sense of belonging and that sense of like we can do it and it can be done. And that's how I ended up here and not traditional. Um, I worked for 18 years on campus, so since graduating, and I'm barely returning back to, to school. And it's something that I really wanted to do, um, but it took a long time and I didn't have the privilege to continue on with education. And so that's one of the things that I'm always, re I always constantly remind myself is that not everybody has that privilege, right? Thank you, panelists your vulnerability. So um, I think we have about 70 people that registered online. We got a full room here. People are wondering about this um, paradox of authenticity and teaching and mentoring. So I'd like to start with Allegra. What's important about that that made you want to like have that be the focus of your award? Mm -hmm. So as a leader, as a teacher, we we teach who we are. <laughs> and the paradox of that, being a Latina, being a mother, having identities that are not the dominant identities in science, that are not the dominant identities when a, a student comes to a UC campus into their large lecture hall with general chemistry and to have someone that looks like me, with long hair, and all that I am, I don't always get the benefit. And many women and many um, people of color don't get the benefit of being accepted as the leader, as the academic, as the person in charge. And so the paradox for me is that how can we be that strong person, that strong leader, but then also be the person that our students need to see, the person that didn't pass these classes, the person that struggled, the person that almost left college, the person that you know, really had all of these other experiences that didn't go to office hours until their junior year. <laughs> all of these other things that happen. And so to, you know, to really have both sides of that is, is a challenge. And um, one of the people that really helped me kind of work through that, it was actually Sue Rosser at um, San Francisco State previously, and she was a provost, and helped me because we have these student experiences of teaching surveys, and they can just be really incredibly hard to read. And thank you to Glenn Milhauser and people in my department that read mine, because it is a traumatic experience for me to read them and to hear just incredibly personal comments that are made that they would never make to somebody who didn't look like me somebody who was male, someone who was older, someone who was white. And so um, really trying to figure out how can you be that leader at the same time, being vulnerable for students to say that you can be here and you belong here and I want you here and you're gonna be successful. It's that, that's for me is where that paradox. And so um, I say I kind of teach two different populations of students. I teach our first gen students and then I teach our continuing gen students. And so really, um, to be able to reach both of them, the way that I do that is through community. And the way that I do that is by giving space for everyone to, to have and, so, and, and having space for them. And so one of the things that we have in chemistry is that we have the Chemistry Learning Center where students can go, it never closes, they can go all the time, they meet each other, they start working together, and it's just, it's a really beautiful space and they share food and we just have a lot of fun there. And so really that's where we can start getting to know each other. And, so. and I'll just ask um, the, the two of you, like what does authenticity mean to you and how does it impact your teaching and mentoring? 
we're all, we're all very, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Um, you know, I was, I was trying to think back to when, when did I first stop showing my authenticity? Mm. Um, I think when I was at Berkeley as an undergraduate, I just kind of hid. You know, I'd sit in the back row, kind of watch what was going on. I'd write my papers, take my exams. Um, I had a few friends that I felt, you know, I could be myself with, but I wasn't really part of the academic machine. I was just kind of watching it. And I think when I got to Harvard, which was on the East Coast, um, there were very few Latinos <laughs> at all. I think there was two that got into the graduate arts and science the year that I, that I went in. Um, I, I just realized, oh, like, where am I? And one of the, the things that I learned there was that if I was too open and too authentic, it would be exploited. People would use that information to overpower, to, to have power over. And my experience at Harvard was that it was a, a acculturation to be a white male. It was teaching me how to be a white male, how to, how to, how to operate from a power place. And you're either underpowered or you're overpowered. So you learn how to, how to assert your power so that you can survive this environment. And it was very hardening, like you had to kind of harden yourself. And I, that was very different from who I am as a human being. And, and it was soul <laughs> deadening to me. So by the time I finished Harvard, I didn't have any, I'd been at Berkeley and Harvard, I thought, I don't wanna be this. This is not the person I wanna be. I don't wanna have a heart attack by the time I'm 50 years old, which half the department had had. And I was just like, you know, this is not a healthy profession. But when I stepped away for 10 years, um, and I came back, I started teaching at Cal State San Marcos, and it was a very different environment there. It was much more student-centered. People would go home at three to take care of their kids. It wasn't that hyper-competitive environment, and I realized, oh, it's not all. All of academia isn't, isn't this, what I had seen. And the other thing I realized, maybe because I was older, or maybe because I'd grown tired, I don't know, but I was gonna be me. And if they could, didn't like it, fine. <laughs> and I would say the, the last thing that I learned was that if you could write grants and you could get money, people would leave me alone. <laughs> and I mean, it's terrible, but it's true. And I, I think I felt like I can be, I'm gonna be me. I'm gonna center my experience in the rooms that I'm in. And I'm gonna learn to do that. I'm not gonna adjust myself for my environment. I'm going to be me. And if they can't take that, then maybe I don't belong there. I don't know. But there was some point when I came back in, and I remember when I was first talking to UCSF, I said, if this job makes me unbalanced and makes me unhappy, I'm going to be gone. Because this, this profession does not matter enough for me to stay in. And ironically, I study persistence in STEM. <laughs> You know, I stu that's what my whole career is on. I've been publishing in it for 20 years. So I study why do people stay and why do people go. And, you know, and, I'm, and I, under I think I, there's something inside of me that understands why people would leave. And the last thing I'll say is that my research was really, when I first started doing the research, there was a lot of emphasis on efficacy. Like if people just believed in themselves, they would just continue on. Mm -hmm. And my research was, was really to, to show numerically and with a longitudinal study that that was not why people of color left STEM fields. We left because of the social experiences that we were having in our academic environments. And I can prove it, you know, like I can show you hard data for that. And, and I, I can see that that has had impact and it has given a power for people to make changes. So my own experience, I used my own experience and my knowledge of what it's like to inform the research that I do and to inform what I write about. Can so I, now I'm authentic. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah. I mean, I, I like what you're saying. It's like, it's not that we're not resilient, right? And I sometimes feel like we professionally develop ourselves to death. And we need to be in this fellowship and learn this skill. And we're, it's, you know, we're never enough. So, so like we're doing our part. But what needs to change in the environment? Oh, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think... Finding out, for me, the, if, finding out what really makes your heart sing 
is really important. Because if you can figure out what you are authentically called towards, what really makes your heart sing, you will stay, you will know where to go with that. And it may not always correspond to what everybody else thinks is the right thing to do, especially professionally, but really having that, that deep soulful journaling or whatever it is to remember what really matters to you. And, and then letting that guide the work that you do. To me, that is the essential piece. Um, and maybe it's in academia, maybe it's not, maybe it's outside. But we've got, you have to listen. You have to stop periodically and listen to that truth and let that follow, follow that. Because when you do that, magic happens around it. And when you're not, you start to feel tired, sick, imbalanced, unhappy. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So, and a lot of times people think you're crazy because you, like when I stopped academia, people were like, what are you doing? Like you got a PhD from Harvard. I'm like, you know, but that's, but my kids are first. They're, my, my culture is kids are first. I'm going to take care of my kids first. So, yeah. Thank you. And I would say for me, authenticity has, um, has had its evolution. So I started pretty young as a professional, as a young professional, having graduated out of college and entering this space where it was really hard to navigate and really bring your true self. But um, I found that over time, the campus has changed um, and my, my ability to be authentic has been built around trust. And so for the most part, the places where I was able to be vulnerable was in spaces like ACE and, and IMSD, where I could completely be seen for my whole self, say, this is who I am, these are my experiences, these are my struggles, but not just my academic struggles, my personal struggles, my financial struggles, and, and, and be seen. And I realized that how much of myself I was not able to share in the different spaces, because for example, after being in the programs as the programs coordinator for I think it was until tw for five years in, um, we were at a conference with one of the faculty uh, directors of the MARC program, Al Soller, he's my friend now. <laughs> and, um, and we were having, you know, a happy hour sort of get together and then he said, tell me about yourself. And I said, oh what do you want to know about myself? <laughs> That's a very complicated, uh, uh, a complicated an a question for me because how much of me do you really want to know, right? Is it that I'm from a really small town in Oaxaca called San Martin Tilcajete, where we're a, a community of 500, I migrated, I crossed the border twice illegally. Like, you see, it's complicated. <laughs> and, but, you know, there was some bravery in that drink, and I said, let me tell you my story. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that transpired out of that conversation was, oh my goodness, like you, how do you do it? How have you done so much? I didn't know who you were. And, and so over time, I feel like, especially with my experience here on campus, is that I've been able to be authentic when I've been able to establish that trust with my faculty and they genuinely are asking the question because they care, because they wanna know who I am. But that took time. And, and now we're at a, at a time in this campus where the, the, the population has changed. We have a lot of Latino students and we are trying to do more for our Latinx community. Um, and so we have to be able to, to realize what types of questions and what are the things that we're asking and how we're engaging. And I think that that hasn't, hasn't been the norm because there was no need because when I was coming to school, I was one of the few ones in those 400, uh, 400 student lecture halls, right? And whether I passed or not, it didn't really matter, but now the focus is changing. And so our approach has to change. And so a lot of me being able to be authentic has come over time and also in the roles that I've evolved into. So I started as the program assistant, then I became the program's coordinator, and then I took the leadership of the office about eight years ago. And I was being asked to step into these um, spaces where there was not enough representation. Like I remember um, in 2015 when I took the directorship um, and one of my first experiences going into a, a large chairs meeting, it was that there, I was really literally the only Latina at that time in the division. And, and then feeling like, like my heart was thumping because I knew that they were going to ask hard questions. And I, as a leader and as a representative, I was representing a whole community. I needed to say something. And so with time, 
I learned that being authentic meant taking ownership and, and empowerment out of my, my, my story and using that to create that change that I wanted to see on this campus. And it took a lot of being vulnerable and you don't know what you're gonna get when you're vulnerable, it's very true. Um, but one of the things that I am proud to say is that I've seen the response from the campus and it's been a positive one. I mean, there's challenges like anywhere, but I have enough students going all over the nation to know that there are very, very, very worse places and UCSC is not one of those. <laughs> and so I think uh, it has come with a lot of trusting who I'm working with, seeing the evolution of where we're heading and where, um, where we're putting the effort to invest. Um, I'm proud to say that, the, that when I started in this position, running the STEM diversity research programs, it was a, st a staff of two running more than nine programs funded by NIH, NIH and NSF and all these multiple grants. But over time now, I can proudly say that the campus is fully funding three of these positions. We just hired a graduate advisor. And only one of the positions that is now four leading five programs is, um, is grant funded. And so I think one of the things is being able to be authentic is really, is really hard and it's not gonna happen right away. And it's hard when you're the only one, but over time you start to see the impact and more and more because our population of students is changing, the need to be able to be upfront and share my story has really created that change for the students that I serve and, and inform my mentorship. And so I think that's where I'm at now. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I want to um, talk about my department, thank them for nominating me for this award, and then also for being open to, to everyone's perspective, but really to my perspective, and to Glenn Milhauser, a chair, for putting together an advisory committee. And he said, can you be on this committee? So well, what do I do? And he's like, whatever I need to know, you tell me. <laughs> and that was so empowering because there was a lot of things that I really wanted to tell him. <laughs> and now I could, and he said, my door is always open. And I see a lot of ways that the institution, so you, the three of us, so Yuli, Yvonne, and I are all alums from here. We love UC Santa Cruz. We've, you know, this is our, this is, this is our formation, this is who we are. But at the same time, we also know that there's so many things that can be improved, that can be better, that we can better serve our students. And so to have leadership that will, that wants to know that as well, so I'm not the person bringing all the problems, instead I'm the person that's identifying the problems and figuring out, okay, how can we be better? And so instead of, so the way that I see this is that instead of saying, okay, you know, this isn't working for me and this is why I'm gonna tell you, it's like, no, this isn't working for me and it's probably not working for a lot of other people as well. And so I'm gonna be that person to say, you know what, this, the system is broken. The institution, like, this has to change. It's not me, this is, this is the system. And so to be able to get to that point has been an, an evolution. Um, but I have incredible appreciation to my department and to leadership of campus that we can have those conversations and people in my department that I have said, you know, I, after this department meeting, I, you know, I feel this way and they're like, you, we need you to say something. You have to say something. Please say something. Don't let this go. We, we want your voice. And so um, I feel like I have the best job in the world because I can, I can use my voice. I think that's so important because we all have stories and a lot of times our students are asked to lead with your overcoming obstacle stories. And it's all about them and your background and what you didn't have, what you didn't, you know, what you, what you need and what you don't have now. And, um, and to be able to hear you say, I'm going to speak so that they can change their story to talk about who they're becoming, what their dreams are. And so that's, that's a really powerful, um, Allegra. Um, I, and, and it kind of leads me to the next thing, like what, in what ways do you see um, the obstacles to authenticity um, manifest in, in, in the students that you have, in the people that you mentor? Like what are you seeing and how do you support them in navigating that? 
so one of the biggest obstacles is to be able to ask for help. And this is an obstacle that I have encountered <laughs> so much. And um, a faculty member at San Francisco State helped me really figure this out. Well, help me have a different perspective on it and that I'm not asking for help. I'm asking for what I need to be successful. And so it's, so really thinking about what I need and, and he, and I, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't need much. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's, it, it's not about that. It's what do you imagine your life as a healthy, successful individual, you need the summer support to pay for childcare. You need the money and the time so you can go and be active so that you can have a life that you want to live. And so you need to ask for that money. You need to ask for that time. And so we're going to ask for what you need to be successful and not just for what you need. And that's what a lot of times when you're doing grants, oh, ask for what you need. I'm like, well, I don't need much. <laughs> no, you know, but what do you need to be successful? And so for students, what I see is that they're not able to ask for what they need. And so we're really trying to kind of work on that. And then the other part about that is to have that vision of what would success look like to you? What, what, would, what is that vision? And so really giving students that opportunity to dream about what they would love to do. Um, and so those, I, I see those as, as the obstacles. I think I'll zoom out just a little bit. I, in academia, there's a culture change trying to happen right now. It has historically been a highly competitive environment where there's winners and there's losers. But when you go outside of academia, a lot of the work that's happening in STEM in particular is very collective. It's group oriented. It's collaborative. It's it, it requires us to be able to communicate with one another. It requires us to not be in competition with one another, but to, to lift each other up. And academia is really trying to shift in some, some departments more than others, some schools more than others. And so I think when I think about mentorship and I think about instruction, I, am, I wanna be part of the shift to the, in the paradigm that we, the, the person who is the, the best is the one who raises the most people up behind them. You know, that's the person. It's not the person who is on top of everybody else. And that when, and, and you see this in, in lots of different ways, right? Our tenure and promotion um, cycles, when you're an, a faculty member, it looks at how much you publish and how much you're first author and how much you're, like, it's all individual. And if you're publishing, in some, in some schools, if you're publishing too much with other people, it doesn't show you have enough independence, right? So, the, so you're, you're penalized for being a good collaborator and being a person who can work with other people. Um, even at NIH, I just applied for a grant that was only, only, you could only apply if you were the sole PI on an R01 grant, which is a kind of a high-tiered NIH grant. So I was advised not to have co-, co collaborators on my grant so that I would be eligible to apply for this MIRA grant. So the reward structures are a little off. And, um, and so I see myself, whether I'm mentoring people or whether I'm teaching uh, faculty or students, of celebrating collaboration, celebrating us lifting each other up and, and recognizing that there's real value in that. And when I'm in the rooms where we talk about tenure promotion and grants and stuff, saying, why can't we celebrate a team that did a good job? Why does it have to be an individual? So I think there's a lot of spaces for us to start to, to, to maneuver that. And the last thing I'll say is, for students who are in the room right now, is to find your people. That's just so important. All my research says that. And my personal experience says that, is you've got to find your people. And if they're not in your department, then go outside your department. If they're not at your university, go outside your university. But find your people. Because in navigating and changing this whole environment, it'll be so much more fun if you have friends. <laughs> I mean, Allegra and I were working together and on a project 
where we were having, we were struggling with, with our environment, but we had fun. Yes. And, we, and we decided we were going to write together, and we we're going to just do, we we're going to run our studies, and we we're just going to have fun. And you cannot say how much, how important it is just to have some fun in the work that you're doing and find the people that make you laugh. And a wise, a wise person said to me, when you're trying to decide what to do in terms of projects and research, first determine, is, is, the, is the question meaningful to you? Second, are they offering you enough money to actually do what you say you're going to do? And third, are you going to be working with people that are fun to work with, that you can count on? And if it doesn't have those three things, then don't do it. So. And for me, I, I think that our campus is aware of, of an area where we need to work in, and specifically for me in the STEM fields has been representation, right? And then, and really, I mean, why are we here at this very moment having this discussion? Because Allegra invited me. I've never been invited on stage. <laughs> and I've been here on campus for 18 years, right? And, and so when I think about what, what are the biggest obstacles in STEM is the lack of representation. And the leaky pipeline is going to continue to be there because the students cannot be, and it's hard to think that you can achieve something you cannot see. If you don't have access to mentors like Allegra, Marcela Gomez, who's engineering, who have become an integral part of my community and my sanity, right? And, and so if the students are not able to find these role models and see the, the leadership be represented, um, and from communities that, that they're coming from, it is hard to have that vision of I can one day be successful. And so one of the things that I've seen in my 18 years is that 90% of our students that are finishing PhDs, it doesn't matter where they're finishing, they're going into industry, right? And that leaky pipeline is going to continue to happen. But I know that it's, there's, it's more complicated than just making those offer. Like right now with the housing crisis and everything that we have to deal with, it's hard. But, have, but really pushing and invest and, and urging the campus to invest in those transformational leaders. You, when you hire a person from a diverse background, you're hiring someone that's going to come and do the heavy lifting because they want to see that change. And so unless we really make that investment and students can really see that representation out there, it's really hard for them to, to really think that this is, um, it seems like something that's like a, a dream that's not achievable yet, right? And, and so I think in, in my area, there's been that sort of like, I, I have these conversations I was, I, and I continue to track my alumni after they graduate from the program, and um, because I continue to, to mentor them and, and work with them through the different issues that come up. But one of the students that, you know, I really said she's going to make it through and she's going to be our next faculty, just decided to take a, a, a position in research, and she was doing a postdoc. Because by the time that they go through the system, they are so jaded by the system. And so one of the areas where we can make that impact is to get that representation going, right? Because that's what's going to move cult that cultural change. That's what's going to really push that through is um, I've seen when Marcella came to campus, and I know she's watching this because <laughs> she told us. <laughs> um, I really saw that transformation, and I've seen her just skyrocket in her efforts and her outreach. Uh, she came to me saying, how do I support your programs? And a lot of our students are mainly in the biomedical sciences, and she was coming from engineer, but she was ready. She's actually going to be a, a faculty judge at the UC Leeds Symposium, which we're heading to tomorrow. But that's the type of leader that you get. You get someone that is not only going to come here and do the teaching and, and do the research, but someone that also has the heart and the passion um, to drive this change and to be there for the students. And when the students see that, that becomes a possibility. That's where I see the obstacle right now. Yuli, I just heard like. Well, first of all, you, this being your first time on stage, I can't believe that. I have to tell you that if Yuli asks for something, she gets it. I rarely donate. I got an email <laughs> one year. It said, we need your money. I just like, whatever Yuli wants. I donated a lot of money that day. <laughs> um, but I heard so much emotion, right? The frustration, the anger, the, you know, the ganas, the, like all kinds of like, and then the excitement and then, you know, so I'm just curious and just thinking about your, the journeys that all three of you have been through, what you went through, 
how you see that manifesting now on campus for whatever reason, for you know, the culture change, all these diff different things. Like, what are you holding in your heart? What are you carrying? And how do you move forward carrying that? Like, what, what is, what, just tell us more about like, what's happening you know, in your heart as, as you're doing this work. Mm -hmm. This really hard work that, that is emotional roller coaster. Mm -hmm. There's heartbreak, there's excitement. Like, mm -hmm. what are you holding? I'll say so, you heard that we have a new general chemistry curriculum and, and it is, it's so exciting. I, every time I come and teach and every time I talk with students about it and we talk about their lab experiments and it's, it's just, it's really, really exciting. Um, but we're, we're, I'm teaching in a movie theater and how is that personal? We don't, have enough resources for we have 125 or 130 students per TA that student is not going to get very much attention we're cramming people into like discussion section rooms the TA can't even walk around and so really thinking about the structure of the university and I know that we are you know we we have the infrastructure we have the buildings that we have but how can we do this a little bit differently so that students can have a little bit more time and a little bit stronger relationships with their classmates, with their teaching assistants, or we know those teaching assistants are their entryway into research um, opportunities and, and with their faculty. And so, Last term, I had to get one of my TAs to just, he answered so many of my emails because I couldn't do it all. <laughs> Thank you, Jorge. And you know, that, was, that was the only way that I could get through it. And that wasn't, that's, that's, I want to be able to do that, but I don't have enough time because there's so many students. And so if there is just some other way that we can restructure some of these large, gigantic classes into something a little bit small. At San Francisco State, I knew every single one of my students with 150, um, all of them. And I still am in contact with so many of them. And here, it's just a fraction because there's just a sea of people. And I don't, I don't like having that, that feeling um, because now it becomes the student's initiative instead of me reaching out to them. And so, I still say, I am here, let's meet. So we have these, we have these spaces for them to, um, to congregate and to study together, and, and that's fantastic, and I, I love having that. And I actually just moved my office so that I walk by this space and I'm able to pass by the SciEx advisors, and it's been so much fun having those relationships as well. It's like, oh, I love it, thank you, <laughs> Crystal. And it's, it's, so to, to just kind of be able to think about the relationships that we're cultivating and what time goes into it, um, is that's, that's really kind of where, where I'm trying to sit and figure out, okay, how can we do this? How can we do this a little bit differently? That was a big question. Yeah. <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple years ago, I, I really sat, I was thinking, my what happens is sometimes in academia, if you start to have some success, you start getting asked to do more things. Like the better you are at what you're doing, the more you get asked to do. <laughs> and, and so the reward is you get more work. And, um, <laughs> and so it, it was like my career started to have its momentum and I was not driving it anymore. And I remember stopping at some point and just saying, wait a second, like I need to really think about this. And, and I, stopped and thought, what, what is it that has always really mattered to me? And I used to, when I was, even when I was little, I always thought that, um, you know, we shouldn't kill each other, we shouldn't be hurting each other, we shouldn't be harming each other. And it always really bothered me when people were unkind to each other, whether it was in a physical way or even in like a, the way we talked to each other. I didn't like it when people were mean to each other. So I had this idea that I would um, talk about kindness in academia. <laughs> and... Uh, I had given a talk and somebody from the Journal of Social, and Isch Social Issues Policy Review came up to me after and said, would you write up what you said? And I'm like, I don't know what I said, but okay. <laughs> uh, and as I was sitting with it, I, I 
I thought, I really want to talk about the social influence of kindness in STEM careers. And um, asked Allegra to be one of the co-authors on, on this paper. And when I was writing it and when we were getting it published, I thought, I'm going to really get hit, hit for this. Like, STEM people are never going to be able to <laughs> handle the word kindness in the same sentence as STEM. <laughs> um, and, but what I found, and I don't know if you have found this too when you've gone out to speak, was that, and I, I, have, I mean, I have spoken to thousands of people at many different societies for different sciences that I don't even know the names of. And people started asking me to come speak. I, was, I, I gave like 42 talks on kindness in a two-year period. It was, it was incredible. And people, what I found was that a lot of people really wanted to be in kind environments while they were doing their STEM work. And there was a lot of people who it really resonated for. They wanted that, but they, nobody had articulated it or had talked about it or said it out loud. And within a couple of years, there was actually a conference on kindness in STEM that somebody got funding for. Wow. And there was somebody who put together an online curriculum for um, humanizing STEM fields. And they used a lot of that paper and my research um, informing that stuff. And I was just so surprised that it just took over. So, that was really close to my heart. Like I, I thought, this, I just felt called to, to write about it and to talk about it and to, to say it out loud. And it's interesting because I feel like it's got its own momentum now and now I'm trying to figure out like what's the next, what's the next thing? And I'm not really clear right now, honestly. I was, what's near and dear to my heart is listening right now to figure out what is that next thing that needs to be explored. And I do keep coming back to this paradigm shift that needs to happen, and that is happening. Um, but I, I don't have it yet, quite honestly. I'm kind of sitting with it. And I think the, the last thing I want to say is that my, my sweetheart, <laughs> he was my high school sweetheart, um, he had a motorcycle accident in August, a very serious one where he had a traumatic brain injury. So for the last six months, he has been regaining um, his mind, really. He's been, you know, learning, relearning a lot of things. And, and so that has made me think quite deeply about what is important going forward in my career. And so I'm evaluating it, kind of thinking about it right now. I don't think I'm going to jump out of academia, but um, I, lot, I think a lot of times there's this illusion that you get to a certain age and you suddenly know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I just want to let you know that, you know, I'm, I'm 56 and I reevaluate and wonder all the time. And I have not settled. And I doubt I ever am going to settle. And I, I think you can only, you have to reevaluate periodically so you can either recommit to what you're doing with really authenticity, right? Or know that it's time to do a course correction in some way. So I am sitting in that right now, to be honest. Like Mika said, that was a heavy question. <laughs> and my question is, how much of it do you really want to know that's in my heart? <laughs> and I'll start by saying that what's in my heart right now is a lot of hope and, I, you know, and, and community and understanding. And I think that those have been the, the values that I've, I've led by. Um, and a part of, of that has been in the past year, I mean, for the complications of being a first generation professional, meaning I don't have an aunt, an uncle, anybody I, I knock a door on and say, can you help me draft this? Do you have advice for me on this situation? And so creating these communities of support has been really essential. But also, um, and for the students that are here, uh, reminding you that, that life in itself is like a, a big full-time internship that you just gotta go through. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and where I'm coming from that is that, for example, last year at around this time, I was fighting for a compassionate release for one of my uncles who was dying in jail in North Carolina at a medical facility. And after basically experiencing that process, seeing how brutal some systems are, I came back charged with hope of what we can do here. Because when we are getting students who are from first generation backgrounds who have made the choice to be here sitting in this very moment, in these classrooms, in this lab that you're leading, in, in that mentoring session that you're having with them, they have overcome so much many times. 
And so at the core of all the things that I, I do, I really lead with that hope. And when the student comes into the office, I, I give them the understanding that I'm here to listen, but to see you, see you and your full self, um, to let them be and exist in the totality, meaning let me know what's really at the core of your heart and, remind, and let's remember why we chose to be here at this very moment. And so I think for me, it has really been essential to, and, and I know that it's, this feels like maybe, oh my gosh, I, could, I should just write a memoir or something <laughs> because um, uh, January, so last year I was fighting for that compassionate release. It took months for my, my uncle's body to go be um, uh, shipped over to Mexico. And in April, I went to the funeral services and I was burying his body. And I got the chance, and it's how things line up. I got the chance to see my great grandmother who um, just passed away January 10th. But one of the things that happened there is that I was able to, to be at, at, at her bedside and, and tell her that I was gonna start a doctoral program. And all she said, Mija, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got the recording, so I have that recording. Um, and it was just one of those precious moments. Um, and, and Cindy's been there for that too in the pandemic when they were recognizing me for the, uh, for the staff, um, Outstanding Staff Award. I was actually in my hometown because she had fallen very ill. This is 2020 in the pandemic. And, though, and so then I think that for me having this full circle of just being able to be in my hometown and being able to, to, to reconnect with my roots and my values and remember what it is that I bring as a person to the campus how important community is to me, how I really try to create and foster those, those, those spaces where, where students will be seen in their totality, where they don't have to hide of any struggles that they're facing and they can just be human has been really important. And I think that for the longest time, I can't tell you that I've been a data-driven program because we haven't had an evaluation in place for our programs. It's been, I'm leading out of the heart and out of the student's need. And many times in the area that I'm in, um, with uh, being sort of uh, direct student services, it feels like being an EMT. Like you're in there in the trenches and you're fixing up and moving them along, right? Um, but over time, I really see how that has informed my practices, how I've led with equity and inclusion. And, and, and so, and before I didn't have that language, right, to really describe what I was doing, but now, I'm starting, I, that's one of the reasons I decided to go back to school because I wanna be able to talk that scholarly language to say, okay, this is what, you, what I'm doing, what I've been doing, and this is the language that, it, that that's there for, right? And um, so I think what's in my heart is that, is that hope that things can change and that hope that students um, can be more seen by their faculty. Uh, one of the things that gave me hope when Allegra came on campus was to, for the first time I had a couple students knock on my office and say, I heard that you're really good friends with Allegra. We wanna throw her a baby shower. <laughs> and, and so when I see those things, all those things feed my heart. All those things give me hope. All those things tell me that, that things are changing. And so that's, that's where my heart is right now. Thank you, Yuli. I want to... Can I say one thing? That I think traditionally academia was about like divorcing your heart from your head. <laughs> you know, and I think if you can think back to, you know, where people were being educated to be slave owners or to lead genocide, I mean, when we think back to the hundreds of years back, mm -hmm. what people were being educated for, mm -hmm. they really needed to divorce their heart from their head or else they couldn't do the things that they were supposed to do as leaders in this nation, um, sadly. And I feel like one of the things that we all share in common is our hearts and our heads are fully connected. Mm. And we're using our brains. <laughs> you know, yes. none of us are like just going by the heart, that our hearts and our heads, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about the Latino culture is that the heart is, is given as much credit as the head. <laughs> and I would say, I was raised at least where if they're in conflict, you follow your heart first. And that's, that is where it's in complete opposition to what traditional academic higher education has, is trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. And to preserve that connection, and not only preserve it, but to utilize your heart to inform your mind and to use your mind in connection 
That is, that is the integrative education that I hope yeah. that we see coming. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very um, touched to be on this panel with women who are living that day and night. Thank you, Nika. That's good. And, and, that's, and that's the beauty of particularly being part of Yuli's program is to give space to work with students and talk about senti pensante, okay? <laughs> to talk about coraje, to talk about really what drives us and how can we make this impact and what are we bringing to this and recognizing that our resistance is power doesn't mean that we're leaving, it means that we're making things stronger. And so really being able to show them all of this body of literature and scholarship in critical race and ethnic studies and talk about Laura Rendon and talk about like just this immense literature that is about them, that is allows them to be who they are and to be strong in who they are is um, it's just, it's so much fun. And then at the same time to have a lot of conversations about well, what, what is affirmative action? Like, how does that affect me? And how should I feel about that? And they're not able to have those conversations with other people, but they have those with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I love what you all are saying and it reminds me of, um, I think my own experience in coming onto campus, like I was in physics. So like you're on Science Hill and then there's the rest of the campus. Right? And so I never got to under, like, I was going through a lot. I got a lot of stories, but it's not about me. And I, uh, but I, it's only after I left academia that I was able to understand, like, social justice, systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. I understand my experience now. We, remember, Yvonne, we used to, we used to pass each other Claude Steele papers, like, yes. undercover. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to buy the new Claude Steele book. <laughs> when stereotype threat yes. was, like, the big thing. And that was the thing, is that we, we got so burned and so kind of just done with threat that we had to move to kindness. We had to move to micro affirmations because yeah. it just couldn't do it anymore. Right. <laughs> Enough yeah. with threat. Enough yeah. with all getting rid of yeah. the bad. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I wish we had more time. So I had to choose the last question. But before I do, we will not waste this opportunity to hear more from Yuli <laughs> while we have her on stage. Yes. And, you know, uh, let's like let's make sure that's a, that's not on the agenda next. More you're getting you more up on stage, up on stage, more up in here. Um, but I just thinking about, um, you know, you got a staff award, mm -hmm. and I, you have done like when you talk about how you've developed your programs, how you're able to get hard money for staff, how you're, you know, everything that you've built here. And I, I don't know, but I'm, 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 I'm putting money down on, you know, you are the one that is most responsible. You're responsible for the most BIPOC students moving forward. Um, I don't have the numbers on that, but I will, I'm, I'm still going to be on it, right? And so as a staff person on campus 18 years, like I know a lot of, I would not have graduated if it wasn't for yeah. some of the student support staff um, mm -hmm. that was here. Mm -hmm. and, and I know like you see them sometimes and they're just tired and they're mm -hmm. frustrated and they're heartbroken. So like, what's your advice to them about getting things done? getting things moving, like how are you able to accomplish that? Like, and I, you know, I don't know how many staff are here. There might be some staff online as well, uh, but like, how do you do it, Yuli? Well, for me, <laughs> is um, listening to them, listening to what they're dealing with, uh, letting them vent, and then making an action plan. It's, uh, if they're coming to the office um, with that, I, I take it seriously and I take their trust seriously and, and so having been on campus for so long, knowing how to navigate the different students' uh, support systems mm -hmm. and just knowing where to point them for the different resources has been really essential. But more than anything is really reminding them why they chose this in the first place, especially mm -hmm. when it gets hard. Um, like, uh, like, you know, Mika has said, we, uh, we lead, we don't separate heart and, and mind. And, and I think I would, un I want to add to that body too, like you taking care of yourself, reminding them what are you doing to take care of. And also it has been being able to, in my experience, have lived some sort of experience that resonates with what they're going through mm -hmm. and sharing my best practices for how I've been able to, 
to survive it, to get through it, um, and really just sharing, uh, you know, being vulnerable with them sometimes. And, and so this is the first time that I'm openly sort of sharing some of the things that I've had to deal with on my other world because, yes, there is a disconnect, you know. Um, it's, it's really ironic that sometimes I can be on, on this hill and I'm really hopeful and I'm encouraging students and I'm saying, you can do it. And then, but the day before that, I've been at a rosary prayer for my brother's best friend who got shot due to gang violence, right? And, and those are my two realities. And so being able to share with them that, unfortunately, this is our reality, but there is hope. And if I can, the other thing that I've really gotten away with, and I must say is, I say, look what I've done with the bachelors. Imagine what you're going to do with the PhD. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it works because the students are empowered to go out there. And, and I have now the evidence of the students that don't just leave campus and go to their PhD programs, but they're leaders in their community. Like they started SACNAS chapters. They're challenging the institutions on how they should celebrate Latinx history, heritage month. And so those are, the, like for example, right now the, the, the person who's coming to fill the uh, grad advisor role, which is a, a new role in our office, that's gonna be hard funded by the division. Um, that, that person is Stephen Paniagua, who's actually one of our Mark alum, who, le who left to Yale, is getting a PhD from, got a PhD from Yale in genetics, and has been leading the Yale Ciencia uh, Academy, so nationwide program. He wants to be here. He wants to create that change here. And, and, and so I've been long enough in the game to see how, what, how transformational these experiences are and the type of leaders we're producing. And all this is sort of what keeps me going and keeps me hopeful. And, and there's going to be a new generation of leaders that are coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Last question before we open it up. There's, I mean, you've always been you. Right? There's always been an authentic you, um, and you know, through, throughout the thread, this journey that you've been on, and so um, that, and, and you've sort of like talked about the survival, survival um, authentic self, but how has that evolved into the thriving authentic self we see now? Like, how are they different, or maybe they're the same, or you know what I mean? Like, what's the, what's the thread there? I think the thread is to go from surviving to thriving is community, is building that community. And for me, for my family, to, for us to have support, to have friends, um, and to have people to, to have fun with and hang out with. And all of us have fun. <laughs> we all have a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and to make time for that. And to make time to do things that are really important one of my most fun things is coaching my daughter Sonia's softball team. And it's, you know, it's just, it's just incredible fun for me to see these girls and to see them just work so hard and, you know, deal with pressure and then just come out um, so strong. And so to have those other things that, you know, kind of help, help make everything worth it. And so to have time with them as well. And so I would say for, for me, the thriving is really having, having a big community and living on campus is pretty great too. <laughs> and opening up my house to the Latinx faculty community networking is, is for me one of the, I, I love having you over. And so it's, um, yeah, so having, having the community, that's, that's, that's very much the difference. As, as an undergraduate, I you know, had only just a few, and those friends are, we're still the closest of the close. Um, but now to have so many more, it's, it's, it's really, I think that's the difference. Yeah, community. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Um, yeah, I think having people who are, who are not so invested in the status quo that they are able to support decisions and you can talk through things that you're doing that maybe isn't like everybody else is doing. I think that has been really important for me. And um, having, having mentors at all different levels has been really important. Like there's this, this kind of myth that you have one mentor and they kind of help you all the way through. 
And I don't think that that's true. I think we have, it takes lots of different mentorship to get me to where I am. And some of, some of my mentors are older than me and who have, who have, are now retired, because um, I'm getting old enough now that they retired. <laughs> my advisor passed away. But I also have mentors that are um, people who are coming up behind me, who are seeing the world in a different way, uh, who use technology in a different way, and trying to stay open to that kind of, maybe there's a different way of doing this. And so I, I think having that kind of ecosystem of mentors mm -hmm. um, who, you know, who you know who to call for what, that really has made a huge difference and not thinking that there's just one person. So that is community in a way. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I got to the point now where I go to conferences and I rarely go to anything. I just talk to people <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's really important. Like I really feel rejuvenated by being able to, to meet up with people that I've known for a lot of years. So that's that's joyful for me. I look for some, I look for joy, mm -hmm. look for joy. And I, and I quite honestly just don't go to the things that don't bring me joy sometimes. <laughs> I like, you should yeah. see the number of meetings that I've just like, ah, this is, this just does, I'm not happy. Yeah. I'm not gonna go anymore, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I'm not a good role model, I don't think in that way, but anyway, Sounds yeah, community, well. mentors, um, mm -hmm. And not and being having your mind wide open to what that mentorship looks like. It's not always the person that way. Sometimes it's the person who's coming up behind, or who's your peer. Mm -hmm. so. And I mean, I can't add too much more than that. Community mentorship, and I would say openness. Um, that's what has what has helped me thrive. Um, being open to. See, there's, a, there's this sense that maybe when you need community, it has to be people from your own community, from your own background, but, but it doesn't happen, you know? And, um, and especially when you become like the only person in these spaces. So I've been able to stay open and create really meaningful relationships with the faculty directors that I've, that I've worked with throughout the years. So when I said Al Saller's my friend, is because he literally said he's my friend. <laughs> And, and it's been just staying open and genuine in conversation to the point that if, and I'll get a, a call from Bill Sullivan, he'll say, hey, so can I run this by you? And I say, yes, Bill. And then I'll, I can say something like, if you thought about it, don't say it, right? <laughs> and so I think for me, being able to be transparent, open, and, and being in, and fostering that sort of community, not of, of like we're the other, but how do we make these bridges, you know, form is we're going to be scared of the other, of the other, if each, if we each, each other don't interact, right? If we're not talking and we're not building bridges among faculty and staff, if we're not in, in like proactively creating bridges to really be in communication. Um, and that, so that I, I, I've learned to thrive in my space by building those bridges with, you know, with faculty, with, with um, my students um, and basically that, that, yeah, and you learn from everybody so much. So for me, being able to thrive has meant stay open, um, stay available and, and, and be open to that experience, right? Because being afraid of the other sometimes comes from not knowing about the other person. And, and, and being able to have genuine conversations about experiences, sometimes it's what's gonna allow others to sort of understand and if they didn't have, so that notion that I'm colorblind and I don't see color, it, it, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You need to be able to see color and be able to say, I wanna learn about what your experience is and, and let the person that you're asking be the one to be in charge of that, like how much you wanna share, how much, but you being open to that, and not shying away from it is important, right? When you're when you're when we're trying to build these bridges. And most recently, um, I just lost my dog of 13 years. Uh, I know it's that's a different type of pain. So, mm. <laughs> and one of the things that, that I learned from that from that loss is that you know when you think of, of a beautiful creature such as a pet, a dog and you spend so much of your time and how happy they get, how mad you can be at them, but how much love they can give you. The biggest lesson that I learned from that, from that passing of, of Titan was that, you know, he, to learn to live in love, with love, and for love, right? Thank you. So we're taking questions now. Um, is there a microphone out there? Or, oh, you can take this. You better take it. Great. 
Sophie of the pen. Just raise your hand if you have a question. And we might have some questions on the on the There's Zoom. someone in the back. Unless there's somebody else who has a no, question. That's you. <gasps> okay, cool. Uh, hi. Uh, I took Allegra's uh, Chem 1C course my first year. And um, sorry, I don't know why I'm crying right now. I love her so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm so happy that you got this award. I don't think I know anybody else who deserves it more. And I remember you talking earlier about how you were sad that Jorge had to take up so much time to, to answer your emails. And I, uh, I don't know how to describe this question. Um, how do you think we could fix that problem in the future of feeling like, as a professor, you can't connect with your students as much as you want to? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, Uh, yeah, smaller class sizes. <laughs> um, I would like to have more time to go into discussion sections, to go and um, have, to be able to have one-on-one -on -one time with students. Um, it's just not, it's, it's just not possible. And so I think right now part of it is that I'm re you know, working on this whole curriculum redesign. And so once you, know, once you teach something like three times, then you really got it down. So this is just one. Um, so maybe in a couple years I'll have more time um, to, to be able to put energy, energy into that. Um, but still at this point, you know, for me, it's, it's really in, in our chemistry learning center in the CLC and PSB 209. Um, which is now right down the hall from my office um, that I walk by and um, and really just and have the time with, with students there and um, yeah that's how would you make smaller class sizes I don't know We're, okay that's, that's, cool. that's, sorry it's yeah it's there after I taught two chem three A's in the fall I can't do that again that was <laughs> that was really hard <laughs> Um, I thought I could and I can't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, we need more people to teach, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't know any other questions. Please, somebody have a question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have to also confess, I did shed many tears during, <laughs> during hearing everyone's lived experiences. You were all so phenomenal and incredibly inspiring. Um, my question is that when you try and navigate being authentic, being vulnerable in spaces, especially when, uh, you know, they're not meant to include those kinds of feelings, right? It's all more about the mind rather than the heart. You know, there is that fear, that initial fear of like, what's gonna happen? What, you know, what's gonna transpire? I was wondering if maybe one or all of you could share, what helps you combat that fear in that space? You know, outside of those spaces, you have love, community, but when, when you're there, like on the battlefield, you know, at the mm -hmm. battle line, what what do you hold on to to give you that courage? Mm -hmm. I have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> Please share. <laughs> I think you have to know you have a toolkit. Um, so, like I said, when I was at Harvard, one of the things I learned was how to like how to be how to operate in a place where you have to show power in order to like hold your own space. And I, it's not my default. It's not the way I want to operate, but. There was a, a time when I, I was leading a National Science Foundation climate change education project where we're doing education for leaders in San Diego on climate change. And I went to a summit, I was asked to give a presentation and I was presenting some, some stuff and this guy, this, <laughs> this guy stood up and he 
posed a question to me in the way that I remember it happening, where they're basically asking you a question to show that they know more than you do. And I was, and I was standing behind a podium like this, and I recognized it. I recognized what they were doing. And I pulled out the, the microphone, I got out, I walked towards him, and I answered in a way that was like, don't, don't do that, like, you know? <laughs> you know? And after, my team said, I've, we've never seen you act that way. Like, that was, really, that was really, like, where did that come from? And I said, that's what I learned at Harvard, was to, like, don't be intimidated by somebody doing that. You just have to, you have to go right towards them and show, like, no. I actually know this. Don't, don't try to do that. And that's in my toolbox. I don't use it very often, it's, but it's there. And I know that if somebody wants to play that game, I can play that game. But I prefer not to. And I will retract back to who I am. So I think knowing, knowing how to operate in lots of different environments and knowing when to step into your strength and your power and when, when not to, that's... That's really important, particularly when you don't fit the stereotype of the per what a person looks like who is a person of authority, power, influence, and you're in a room with lots of people who are that. You have to, you have to own it and be not afraid of that piece of you. Um, and that is a part of me. Whether I like it or not, it is a part of me. And it's in my toolbox. So I'm not afraid because, you know, go ahead, try it, you know. That's, and I would say, we all know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I think for me, what comes to mind is, uh, what are you trying to accomplish? And knowing um, what it is it in that moment that's needed. Like, why, why is there the need to be authentic? Is it to, to get a point across? Is it to move the needle somewhere? Is it to back up whatever it is that you, you, you want to accomplish? Or um, is it to create understanding? So really having a good pulse on what it is that you're trying to accomplish and it, does it require to, you to be vulnerable and authentic or can that be skipped? And know, knowing who your audience is, you know, what are you trying to do with this is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're really good at our work. <laughs> <laughs> and proud of the work that I do. And the work stands for itself. And so to know that what you do is the best, that we know lots of ways it can be better, but what you do and what you know, you know. And so to have that security in who you are and what you're studying and how your approach is helping address this there's, you know, that's, that's how you get <laughs> this puffiness. <laughs> that's, how, that's how you, you know, is, is to know, is, is the knowledge. So. I would say, whatever I do, I really always try to do it with respect. I don't, I, I don't ever want to belittle people and I don't want to disrespect people. Yeah. So I, I'm going to, that's the authentic me. I don't want to be disrespectful to people even if I disagree with them and even if they're coming after me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a part of my authenticity is keeping that true. So. Okay, I think we have time for another question, if there is one. Hi, I'm a transfer student, so I never had the opportunity to take your class, but I'm sure it was wonderful. Um, I, I heard you mention earlier about a chemistry learning center. Is that an, a resource we have here on campus? Yes, it's a resource that we have designed for general chemistry, um, but it's something that I'm gonna say that if you think that it's something that you would benefit from in your classes, to talk with your instructor and say, how can we create a space for people in our class to come together and work together? And whether that might be in discussion section or, so it's gonna be something that you're gonna tell your instructor, I really need this, I need to work with other people and I'm not sure where to find them. 
And I don't know, you know, and so a lot of times faculty will have mm, their office hours where it's kind of one-on-one -on -one and say, you know, I need to find my peers. I need to work with, with people in the class. And, um, and TAs are really a great resource at that. We have our TAs do a lot of stuff with like, oh, all the Porter students are gonna sit together and all the Crownies are gonna sit together. And all, you know, so whether it's in your college or you know, finding those commonalities, but let your instructor know that, that, that you need a little bit more time trying to work with other people in your class. And so that's, um, yeah, again, ask, ask for what you need. Well, that would help you be successful. Great, thank okay. you. Thank you, those were all great questions. Um, and I think the theme tonight was community. I mean, and when you think about it, even this question of like, how do you find the courage to, to speak up and the answers about knowing who you are or knowing what you have to do in order to exert like your authentic power. Um, and if you're not able to do that, I think it's really important to get curious about that, to ask questions. You mean, you see a coach, or you know, a therapist or your advisor or these great mentors or you get your community together, get your people together is what I'm hearing from these um, wise women here. So in, to close, I wanna just um, turn it back over to Allegra for final thoughts and um, let us know like what's next for you. Well, I just, I just wanna thank my department for nominating me for this award and for COT for the time you spend looking at all these applications and, and just for the campus for being open and really celebrating teaching and putting it out there. Um, because this is, you know, now, now that we have so many more teaching professors, you know, it's, it's really exciting the different things that we're doing. And so again, finding that community and, and really developing that community, um, here at UCSD and across the UC system has been really exciting. Um, so I just want to say you know, thank you to UCSD and to my department um, for really just believing and seeing, um, seeing the possibility and yeah, yeah, seeing the possibility and, and, and having, believing the vision too, having a vision.